All right. Welcome, everyone, to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, uh, Everything You Need to Know About Raising Broiler Chickens. I'm Jesse Schmidt, and I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project and the Women's Ag Network. I'll be moderating this evening. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Mike Derry, Professor of Extension, our Professor and Extension Poultry Specialist at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Derry is the lead Extension Poultry Specialist uh, for all of New England. He organizes and runs the New England New York Biosecurity and Poultry Pest Management Conference, and much of his time is also devoted to providing information and help to small poultry producers. So we're lucky to have you with us, and welcome, Mike. Thank you very much, Jesse, and I appreciate the people up in Vermont sponsoring this, and welcome to everybody who's on board tonight. I've only done a couple of these webinars. I'm used to speaking to live people instead of looking at a computer screen and talking to it, so if I sound strange or, or say something funny, go ahead and laugh, just say ha-ha in the box, and we'll, it'll make me feel better. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you look at the title, I said almost everything new to know about raising burly chickens. There's no way we can go to everything in an hour, and there's no way that I could say I know everything about raising broiler chickens. Um, I know enough to be dangerous, so, as they used to say, but uh, I'm going to pass on as much information as I can. A little more background about me. I've been here at the University of Connecticut for 31 years. I got my uh, degrees in animal science and environmental animal physiology at the University of Illinois, and uh, I've been at the University of Connecticut here as the Extension Poultry Specialist, I say, for 31 years. I also teach an introductory animal science class. I teach the poultry science class here, and I also teach a class on um, behavior and training of domestic animals. So I keep a little bit busy. Recently, along with Dr. Richard Brzezowski up in Maine, we've been doing some training of other people to learn more about being poultry service providers through a uh, Northeast SARE project. So hopefully we're going to extend some of this knowledge out into uh, more areas throughout New England. So if anybody is interested in learning more about being profitable in their poultry business, uh, let us know because the SARE project, that's their, their main goal is to do things like that. Um, okay, I don't know what's going on with our picture here. Well, hold on, Mike. It looks like okay. someone uh, hit the application sharing button. So yes. you have to be a little careful with uh, what buttons you're pushing here. Let's see if I can get yeah. this screen to close. Hold tight. Yep. Anyway, while you're working on that, hopefully you can all still hear me. So I will uh, start out a little bit, just seeing I notice some of you already have birds, some of you have layers, some have, some broilers have done this. Um, the few things I'm going to go over tonight is basically choosing a broiler type bird, and a little bit on housing and uh, uh, structure, infrastructure that you need for raising broilers, whether they're inside or out. Um, We'll touch very little on any health issues because that's a whole other uh, ball of wax. It's a whole seminar in itself on health. And then we'll finish up a little bit about how to process and wh or where to get birds processed. So um, how do we get to the next slide? Let me do that and then the next slide here. What I put up here is a small flock owner checklist. And notice at the top of it, I have selecting the bird. I think before you even decide to get into poultry business, you need to know that there are different types of birds and what kind of bird is it that you want to raise. And that's going to be based on <coughs> what you want from the bird, whether you want eggs, whether you want meat, or whether you want a show type bird. And tonight I basically put down type of poultry meat type, and we'll talk about the different meat type breeds that are out there. Uh, eggs is a whole other issue. We've talked about that once before, and I think we'll probably have more of those on it. The next thing, once you've chosen the type of bird, is where are you going to get the bird from? Uh, many people buy birds from the local feed store or area like that, and some are from what we call the National Poultry Improvement Plan, that's the NPIP. Some are from that source, which means they'd be Plorum and avian influenza free, hopefully if you buy from them. If you don't, then we're not sure what you get. 
The next thing is to plan for what we call an all-in, all-out flock. And basically that means you buy all your birds at once, you raise them all at once, and you process and get rid of them all at once, and then you clean up and get ready for uh, the next flock. And that maintains biosecurity and helps prevent disease spread from flock to flock. So that's something you really need to think about. Um, now, before the birds arrive, on this checklist you see is draft-free coop or housing. Well, that's basically for winter and cold weather. Uh, we don't really consider drafts that much in the summer, unless, of course, you're raising baby chicks with a heat lamp, and then you always want a draft-free housing. Otherwise, you may be inside or outside, which means you're not going to prevent draft if you're raising birds out in the outside or in pasture. Um, if you are raising broilers uh, from baby chicks, obviously you're going to need some sort of heat source. So we have brooder stoves, heat lamps. Uh, red bulb pipe is OK. Uh, set for 95 for the first week and drop it about 5 degrees per week as you go. If you're not getting the red bulb pipe, the other ones are the ones they use for reptile uh, terrariums and things like that. They don't have the red lamp, but they just have the infrared heat and you don't see the red light. Those are also good, but you do need some sort of heat source for those baby chicks. On the floor, I prefer litter in, in the houses if you're going to have any type of coop. And I prefer the pine shavings. And the reason is wood picks up moisture and re-releases it very easily. It's easy to clean, easy to compost. And it doesn't get as moldy as if you're using some sort of hay or straw as you're bedding. Uh, but that's again up to you. If you have an access to really inexpensive hay or straw and you're willing to clean it out every couple of days and prevent the mold, that's not so bad if you can clean it out. It's just a lot of work. Roost. Birds like to roost, even broilers. Now, broilers don't need to roost too much, so about two to six inches above the ground is, is about all you'll ever want to do for a broiler bird. And something round. I like clean tree branches because they're round, they fit the feet and it's much more uh, ergonomically suited for these birds. And of course, feed. Appropriate for the age, and we're going to talk about that. A lot more on the checklist. These are hopefully common sense things, but check for symptoms of disease. And I listed all those here. Make sure you provide water for your birds prior to giving them feed. The reason for that is if they've been shipped in, sometimes the birds get what we call pasty butt. And that's where they the manure is fairly dry, and it actually dries on their vent before they're able to uh, make full excrement of it. And it sticks to them and actually works like a plug. And then you have to get a warm washcloth with some warm water and dampen it first. Don't just try to pull the plug out, because you will pull skin with it. And I don't think the chicks like that. So put some moisture on it, soften off that, that bit of manure that's on your butt, and then clean it off so that they can let manure out. Um, sometimes if they've come a, a long distance, they may need a little more extra energy. And this is about the only time they can use table sugar with a chicken. You can give them a 5% sugar water solution for the first day, which gives them a little boost. Works pretty good for them. And again, checking your waters, feeders, and stuff. For baby chicks, you don't want super cold water. Room temperature water is good for the first couple of days so that they can uh, drink the water without chilling. That's one of the problems we've seen in, in death early on in some of these birds is they get really cold water, and then they get chilled, they don't eat, and then they, they fall over and die. So you don't want that to happen. If there's any way that you can prevent predators, such as wild birds and rodents getting in, do that. And of course, what we call biosecurity. And we'll talk a little bit about biosecurity later. But in general, we're talking some sort of foot dip, anywhere else that comes on your property, make sure that they're not bringing disease in. Uh, clean shoes or boots. Limit visitors and traffic to where your birds are. That way you keep your birds healthy and safe. On a regular basis, daily, check your birds for every day. Go out and, you know, at least twice a day, go out and take a look at them, see how they're doing. If you, excuse me, think you have a disease, get a reliable diagnosis and treat as necessary. Now, that's the hard part. Where do you get a reliable diagnosis? There's not a lot of avian veterinarians around. But there is a lot of material out there that gives you some ideas. If you have sneezing, wheezing, coughing, obviously there's something wrong. And then you can call 
get a hold of uh, one of the local service providers that we're training through the SARE project, or a local vet that you can talk to on the phone and say, this is what I, the symptoms I'm seeing. I don't necessarily want to bring it in, but what can you suggest? So build up a good uh, rapport with your local vet, and some of them will learn to treat birds. Uh, it's not that bad. And again, I, if you're keeping birds for a long period of time, you want to establish a regular deworming program for broiler-type birds, but not going to be around very long. This may or may not be an issue. Uh, and the rest of it is pretty common sense. Proper disposal of your manure. Composting works fairly well, but again, don't necessarily let your birds go hang around your compost site. Now let's get into choosing a breed. Um, okay, I noticed that there's a question here. Should food be removed from the chicks at night when they're under a light to prevent overeating? Broiler chicks can have food as long as they want it. They won't necessarily overeat because that's what they do. Uh, especially range birds, they're going to burn up energy running around on the range. But for babies, for the first few days, they really shouldn't be out on the range anyway. Uh, but food, feed and water. Once you give them the, the first bit of water, after a couple hours of letting them just have water, then you provide feed for the birds, and they can eat on a regular basis. So they should have fresh feed and water 24-7 while they're growing. So let's talk about choosing meat breeds. This picture here is basically your Cornish cross. Uh, some people do try to arrange them, and some of them will do okay. Some of them, they get pretty heavy, pretty fat very quickly, and uh, they don't tend to want to walk much. So you want to make sure your feed and water are close to each other and close to the birds. They're not the best range birds because they're very fast growing. So we'll talk about some other ones, uh, these hybrid varieties, the reds, barred, silvers, and some of the other what people call the dual purpose birds, the barred rocks uh, and others. So some of the colored feathered type birds like this, the Freedom Ranger. I'm sure many of you probably had Freedom Rangers or tried them or, or heard of someone that had them. They're becoming a very popular range type broiler or pastured broiler bird. They take a little bit longer to grow, anywhere from 7 to 10 weeks to get your 5 to 6 pounds on them. But because of the slower growth, you get a little bit more uh, flavor to them. and you don't have a problem with them going down on your legs. They can get some good legs under them before they get too big. Uh, this JM Hatchery is one of the places that sells the Freedom Ranger. I think they, they consider themselves the inventor of it. But uh, So I put the information here, and you can call them by at 717-336-4878. That's how you can order from them and find out when they're available. Last I heard, they were selling out very quickly. So if you have interest in the Freedom Rangers, Go check them out. And here's what uh, one of the people said about him, that he fed a lot of feed to them and ended up with a, uh, three and a about 3.17 pounds of feed per pound of gain. Uh, not bad for a range bird, but when you consider the Cornish cross in a commercial operation would get about 1.8 pounds of feed per pound of gain. It's a little bit different. And this picture, he showed me the variation he got on his range birds. Uh, you can see that the one on your left is pretty good meaty, nice looking one, whereas the one on the right looks like it wasn't eating too well and not doing quite as, quite as well. Looks more like a uh, dual purpose barred rock or something that's being processed for meat. But if you take care of them, you can maintain your uniformity. Uh, this guy wasn't doing very good for uniformity. Then there's the red broilers. There are people that are importing these type of birds from France and using them here in the United States. Uh, they call it Le Belle Rouge in France. They grow to about uh, five, five and a quarter pounds, a little bit over five pounds in about 12 weeks, so they're a lot slower. Uh, obviously, the Cornish Cross can do this a lot quicker. This is a longer uh, breasted bird. It's uh, Looks kind of like a uh, one of our domestic barred rocks or Rhode Island red type with a little bit of broiler in them to end up getting the meatier, but also the longer leg birds. So they are pretty good. They're, they're even <coughs> very well on pasture and range birds. So that's what people do. Um, you can get these birds, uh, some of the red type, they call them a red ranger, uh, MT, Mount 
or MTDI poultry farm and hatchery. So I put this information up here so you can see. Again, they are a uh, NPIP hatchery that I noted that I uh, noted earlier that you want to get from. So they're <coughs> Salmonella pylorum free and typhoid. Uh, clean and they're avian influenza queen. So you know that you're getting good healthy stock to start with. They also sell at this uh, MTDI poultry farm and hatchery. They sell a Cornish cross, a Red Ranger, and what's called a Rosambrel. And I'm going to show you what these birds look like next. The Rosambrel is, is a relatively new bird. Um, it's offered by the hatchery. They're growing to about 8 to 10 weeks. Again, that brings them somewhere between 5 and 6 pounds live weight. And you can figure about a 75% dressing percentage. That means 75% of your live weight will end up as your carcass weight, which is uh, pretty good. That's what you're looking for on these type birds. It has uh, a good benefit of the red broiler with faster growth than the red, but a little slower than the corner. So, they, they do a little more efficient, and they're really good in this, this area here, especially for pasture range birds, too. Here's some uh, baby chicks of that, that breed. Uh, they say it's fairly profitable, uh, and it has good disease resistance. And uh, the people that are growing them, I've never eaten one, so I don't know personally if they taste any better. Uh, but the people that are growing them seem to like them and seem to be a market for them. So if anyone is growing these and they want to make a comment about it, throw it up there and we'll let everyone else know what, what you think of them. Then, of course, if you want to get more of a commercial type bird, this is what the commercial industry grows. This is a Ross 308 broiler. This is probably the most popular bird in the world as far as uh, broilers growing right now. Uh, the Cornish Cross, they're very quick. We can get in most commercial operations, they're raised to about five pounds live weight in under six weeks, somewhere around 38 to, to 42 days. Um, another hatchery in the area, Moyers, over in Quaker Down, Pennsylvania. They have, again, their Cornish cross. They call it the Moyers Broiler Roaster, and uh, it's a pretty good bird. Um, they also have the, uh, the K-22, they call it, their red broiler. It's only a male bird because this is a, a selected breeding bird. It's a little slower than the Cornish, but it does a pretty good job. So you can get five pounds around eight weeks, which is a little better than the others going to 10 to 12 weeks. I know some people also, they grow what they call the kosher kings, and um, they're good birds too. There's a lot, I said, there's a lot of different breeds out there that do a pretty good job. Uh, Strombergs, chicks and game birds, that's another hatchery that does pretty good. Um, the red broiler from Strombergs is, is pretty similar to all the other ones. So this is not an all-inclusive list of all the type of meat birds that are out there for sale for the small flock industry. Um, I'm sure other people have found other others in their local area who may be growing something specific in their region that they really like. Uh, the bottom line on this is find something that's going to be hardy in your area, something that if you're selling to other people that they enjoy the meat from and they like it and they're willing to purchase it from you, and that uh, does well out on pasture if you're doing pasture, does well in coops if you're doing coops. So, Again, choosing the bird that best suits your needs is important, and finding the breed that meets that need is also important. Some of the others that are out there, uh, the Knoll family, uh, this is Knoll's Poultry Farm in uh, Kleinfeltersville, Pennsylvania. They have a uh, what they call a silver cross, and again, it's about eight or nine weeks to five pounds. It's a really good pasture type bird that's relatively new out there. Seabees. Uh, over in, in California, they do sell some of those around this area. They have red and black, uh, the meat, they're not black meat, they're black birds. I know it's a CV black meat variety. It's not black meat, it's just a black bird, uh, kind of like the picture you saw earlier with the red chicks and the black chicks. Um, and uh, they're developing a new hatchery, these people, Matt and John, Shady Lane Poultry. And they've got some broiler lines that they're coming up on their own. They're trying to do alternatives uh, 
to the Cornish cross also, more for the pasture reared people. Privet hatchery has a slower growing white broiler. It's it's like a Cornish cross, but I think they cross something else in with it. I don't know what what at all it is. Uh, it's kind of like a dual purpose, and I say the dual purpose means that they're used for egg laying, and then at the end of the cycle you want to use them for meat because they're a little heavier than a white leghorn, which weighs next to nothing. Some of the red and gray broilers are also good for range rearing. They're get right here in New England. You get them from Yankee Chicks or Hall Brothers Hatchery here in Connecticut. Gourmavian Farms, Gary Proctor here in Connecticut is selling some of the red broilers, and some other birds can be ordered uh, in if anyone out there knows uh, Mr. Morris Burr, also in Connecticut, he's a he's a broker for all types of poultry, and he can get you pretty much whatever you want. If you want layers, if you want broilers, if you want turkeys, ducks, geese, Morris Burr is the guy to go. If you're not satisfied with any of those and you want to know where the NPIP hatcheries are, I put this listing up. Again, not a complete list. This is just some of them that are out there. Uh, Townline Hatchery, Mount Healthy, a lot of people are using that. Belt Hatchery, Estes Hatchery, these are some of the ones that uh, small flock owners are, are using to buy their, their birds from. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Brzezowski asked a question, is the reason Warriors K-22 Red Burl are always male because the color is sex link? I think that's part of it. And also because they're using their females as kind of a dual purpose layer bird too. So they don't sell them necessarily as, as meat birds. They can get more for them as, as pullets later on. So let's get on to what it takes to um, really raise a bird. What are the basic needs for your, your broiler? Now think about it. They need fresh feed. They need fresh water. They need fresh air. They do need light and darkness. Um, People think in the commercial industry they're running them on 24 hours of light and, and that they're just uh, force feeding them all kinds of stuff. Well, that's not really true. Most of the broiler producers out there, they start them out on 24 hours, which I don't agree with. I think they should be on 23 hours of light to get started. Always have one hour of darkness so the birds are actually adapted to the dark. Because when birds are on 24 hours of light and then all of a sudden the light goes out at night, they're scared. They don't know what's going on. So. Make sure they always have at least an hour for the first week or two. So about 23 hours of light is good for the first four or five days, really. And then you drop it down to about 20 hours of light and four hours of darkness. And then you can bring it down to even 18 hours of light and um, the rest darkness to make sure that you end up with good growth, slower growth, because you're not pushing them. You don't need to. For those that are going pasture rearing, if they don't want to do any supplemental lighting, that's fine, too. It just slows them down because they don't need as much in the dark. Thermal environment. Again, we talked a little bit about that for the baby chicks. You want to make sure that you start with an ambient temperature underneath the heat lamp of around 95 degrees. And I say around that because watch your birds. If birds are all huddled up underneath the heat lamp, they're too cold. They're too, excuse me, they're too cold and they're looking for heat. If they're all spread out, as far as they can get away from the heat lamp, they can't get any farther, and they're all panting. Obviously, it's too hot. And uh, you can tell if you have a draft if all the birds are one side or the other of your heat source, and they're all huddled up on one side or the other. There's a draft from the opposite side blowing the heat over there because they're looking for the heat. So you want to make sure that you have a good, even thermal environment for your baby chicks, and drop it about five degrees a week, or watch the birds when they start panting. If it's the middle of summer, you may not need to do much heat at all because you may end up with a 95 degree day and you got natural thermal environment. Protection, very important. You want a protection from all those predators and from each other so you don't have fighting going on. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't overcrowd your birds because if you overcrowd you're going to have fighting. That's where the space comes in. Adequate space. And people say, well, how much space do I need? Okay. If you're in a coop, you know, then you want to make sure you have about one and a half to two square foot per bird. And in that one and a half to two square foot, that includes the, the space taken up by the feeders, by the waterers, and some roost if you're going to put them in there. Okay? So they have plenty of room. If they're outside, 
that depends on zoning in your in your region. Some of them will allow up to 50 to 100 broilers per acre. You might not want to go over that because it'll overgraze and it'll scratch it up. If you're just making an outside run in your backyard, then you want 5 to 10 square feet per bird in a run for broilers, and that gives them adequate for running around. Works pretty good. Seeding. I can tell you feeding in just a few short words. Buy, bag, seed. Now, some of you may argue and say, well, I want to make my own feed, and I want to do this and live off the land. That's fine if you can do it. Uh, it may be a little more expensive. The reason I say bag feed is because the nutritionists that work for these feed companies know what the formulations are that are required for birds at the different ages. So they're complete rations, and I'll show you some of these in a little bit. They have all the vital nutrients that the chickens need in every bite. If you are going to mix your own feed, there are formulations out there, and I'll um, and I have some references at the end of this where you can look up and how to mix some grains, and I have some couple of formulas there if you're going to mix your own grains. But again, you want to make sure that you have the proper amino acid balance and you have the proper vitamin and minerals. One of the advantages of bag feed is that it's all there. Now, don't just buy any any bag feed. Buy quality from a name brand because when it comes to chicken feed, you really get what you pay for. So enough said on that. Let's look at feeding. What do the birds need? Well, they need basically the same things that we need as humans. They need carbohydrates. They need proteins. They need fat, minerals, vitamins, water, and of course, good fresh air or oxygen. Carbohydrates mainly <coughs> provide energy for the bird, and one of the main sources of that is our grains. So we use corn or wheat in the diets to provide the energy they need in addition to fat. Fat is required in the diet because you need to mobilize the fat-soluble fat vitamins and also for building cell walls and tissue. Fat is a, is a major component of that. Obviously, protein, people think, well, I need a 17% protein or a 23% protein. What they really need is they need a certain balance of amino acids that adds up to at least that level of crude protein in the diet. If you're missing an essential amino acid, all the protein in the world won't do any good because without that building block of that amino acid, you're not going to do very well. OK, it looks like we're having trouble with some of the sound here, Jesse, if you want to help people out and see why. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I think I'm seeing that it's slowing down. It may have to do with uh, people's individual internet connections. Um, so okay. uh, if you are having trouble and you haven't yet gone through the audio setup wizard, I recommend that you do that. It's found under the tools menu at the top left of the screen. Um, so, and what you will find, sometimes the sound will cut out, and then uh, you'll kind of hear a speeded up version of the presentation. You shouldn't miss anything. Um, the webinar system automatically compensates for the, those uh, speed gaps. Um, so let's continue. So I'll sound like a chipmunk when you go on the fast speed. All right. So basically, if you look at a baby chick that requires 13 different vitamins, it requires uh, 13 to 16 different minerals, as they're called, inorganic elements. They have at least 13 amino acids that are required, that they have to have, that they can't manufacture in their body from the other ones, and essential fatty acids, and they need energy. So to get this, nutritionists use different sources of, of grains and ingredients. So this is basically what makes up most of the uh, poultry diets, commercial or otherwise. They use uh, different types of cereal grains. They, some of them use animal proteins. Right now, that's getting a little controversial. Some people don't want the animal proteins. And that means poultry byproduct or, or beef or pork byproduct. Um, people worry about mad cow disease getting into the chickens while it can't. That's, that's only a mammalian problem and it doesn't get into the chickens, and it doesn't get into their meat and get passed on to humans. So that's not really an issue, but some people want an all-vegetarian diet for their bird, which is fine, so they keep the animal proteins out. <coughs> well, we do have lots of vegetable proteins, fats, 
Uh, some animal fats can be used too, and of course the micro or macro minerals and vitamins. So let's move into this. Um, going right along here. So the amino acids, in other words, the things that make up proteins. Proteins are chains of individual amino acids. And uh, those are what we need in the diet and very specific ones. And we can get them from either animal proteins or vegetable proteins. But we have to be careful how we mix them. Um, and sometimes there are other ingredients we call microbiological ingredients. In other words, bacterial byproduct uh, also can give us some of these amino acids. And then, of course, there are what we call synthetic amino acids, which the body can't tell the difference between that of the purified amino acids or purified proteins, as they call them. And purified proteins come from either animal or vegetable protein, where they actually break down the protein into individual amino acids, sequester just the ones they want, and put them back. That would be an extremely expensive way of doing it. But those are done for research purposes, mostly. So let's talk about the basic mix. The two most used vegetable or um, non-animal ingredients used in these diets would be corn, which is low in lysine, and soybean meal, which has a little more lysine but is low in methionine. But corn is fairly rich in methionine. However, even that being so, we still add a little extra methionine because that's one of the limiting amino acids. And methionine is a sulfur-containing amino acid. And for those who have had nutrition, uh, you probably remember that, that there's two of them, methionine and the cysteine. By adding a little extra methionine, we can spare, or we don't have to add as much what they call cysteine <coughs> to the diet. But when we put the two together, they're complementary. They work really good. So that's why you see corn and soybean in most of your poultry diets in this country. Um, and it's really good and it's highly digestible for the birds. Uh, carbohydrates and fat, they supply energy. So we get the sugars, starches, gums, they all come from the cereal grains. Corn, oats, barley, rice. Unique thing about corn, it not only has carbohydrates, but it has fat in the corn oil. And it's a good fat for the birds. It helps keep their, their skin healthy. <coughs> They use it to, to fulfill their, or to fill up, so we say they're preen glands, so they preen, keeps their feathers nice, so there's things that really need. And why do we need energy? They need energy for heat and, and maintenance. They need things to go really good. Um, chickens need about 13, 1500 or more calories of, kilocalories of energy per pound. So we call a calorie. Now, in, in human terms, when you say I'm eating, you know, so many calories a day, you're really talking about kilocalories, thousand calories. That's a big capital C. When we talk about <coughs> poultry diets, you see we're talking about kcal. That's thousands of calories because one calorie is that energy to raise one gram of water one degree centigrade. Um, so when we when we look at these, we want to know that there's enough energy in the diet to sustain maintenance as well as growth. So that's what's important. Um, talked about nutrients from natural components of pasture diets, such as bugs, grass, legumes. Yeah, I'm going to get into that a little bit. <coughs> also, that those are supplemental things that uh, can be part of the diet. But uh, for a bird to really thrive and grow well and fast, they need more than just what they pick up off the ground. <coughs> Fats and oils, again, corn oil, vegetable oils, animal fats can be used. Uh, linoleic acid is, is a required one for birds, so that's the one that has to be there. Other than that, they can manufacture the other ones. So we don't really use too many animal fats. They're solid at room temperature, uh, although they're relatively inexpensive. The vegetable oils that are liquid are actually better, but slightly more expensive. But they're, they're easy to digest, and they help with pellet quality if you're going to use pellets or crumbles. And reduces dustiness in the feed, and it makes up what we call the feed more palatable <coughs> and supplies energy. So this is interesting. If you have high energy, you can reduce the feed intake of a bird. <coughs> or if you have a bird that has a lowered feed intake, for example, in hot weather, 
birds tend to reduce the, the amount of feed they eat. So if you add more energy into the feed, they can eat less of it and still maintain the energy that they need. So it isn't necessarily that they're going to reduce because there's more. There's still a need the body has. And again, um, if you have a high feed intake, you can reduce the energy to meet their total energy needs for the day because they're eating a lot more feed. The time they'd be doing this is when it's pretty much cold out winter time. They uh, tend to eat more because they're metabolizing more to maintain body heat. <coughs> so basically everything in the diet can be a source of energy, including protein. And uh, you don't want them burning protein as an energy source. It's cheaper to add carbohydrates or fat than it is to have them burning up protein to maintain that energy that they need. So let's look at this. This is basically what I call the, the feed energy breakdown. What they take in, if they can digest it, in other words, and break it down and metabolize it, okay, then they'll use it. Otherwise, it goes out as fecal energy. So if they can't break it down and, and they can't absorb it through their intestines, then it goes out as energy in, in the fecal material, which is why feces is good for manure because there's protein in it, there's other things in it that are good nutrients for the soil. So we want to turn it back in because birds are not 100% uh, able to utilize everything that goes through their feed. <coughs> uh, I know some of these arrows got a little skewed. I think the, the way the slide showed up here on the, um, the way the slide showed up in transition from what I get sent to what's here, the arrows got a little moved. But the next thing is we call metabolize. In other words, energy that's absorbed and that goes into the body. When they break it down, there's byproducts of that, and that's the urine and gas. And then you get what we call net energy. And the net energy that's left from the feedstuffs can be used for production or maintenance. And then it's obviously used to maintain heat because these birds are what they call homeotherms. They need to maintain somewhere between 105 and 107 degrees Fahrenheit body temperature. That's quite a bit of heat they need to maintain. So that's a little bit on energy. Vitamins, they need everything except vitamin C because they can manufacture the vitamin C. And they help with the reactions. So we have the two types, the fat soluble, A, D, E, and K. And we have the water soluble. Now the interesting thing about poultry, we can't just use any form of vitamin D. They require the D3, the cocalciferol form of it. So it has to be vitamin D3 added to their diet. Okay? Even though birds may be outside and get sunlight, they don't convert a lot of it. Okay? They, they don't have the skin surface hair exposure uh, because of the feathers. So they don't convert a lot, enough vitamin D2 to D3 through their skin like we do. So then, of course, we have the different water-soluble vitamins. and Poultry have a very high requirement for choline. So you got to make sure that you have choline in there. And that is used as one of the neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, along with other things in the body. So it's very, very important. The problem is vitamins, especially fat soluble, if you don't have an antioxidant in there, they will be destroyed and they'll have no vitamin value. And the water solubles, again, they get weak over time. and so time, temperature, and humidity will destroy vitamins. So you want to make sure you have fresh feed, meaning less than two months old, in, that you're feeding the birds. Because as it starts getting older, you start losing some of the vitamin value. Uh, these different macro minerals, in other words, they need fairly large amounts in the diet. So when we blend diets, we not only look for protein, energy, okay, and fat, but we're also mixing for the proper amounts of uh, minerals. And usually, if you're going to mix your own feed, then you want to buy what we call a vitamin mineral mix that you can add in because it's very hard to get all these uh, vitamins and minerals from uh, other ingredients that you may just be growing locally. So again, there's quite a bit of stuff in feed. So what's the objective here? The objective is to start your birds out <coughs> with a fairly good growth early on. Baby chicks have a very high requirement for protein. So therefore, usually the chick starter diet are around 24, 23% crude protein with the balance of amino acids because they're putting on lots of muscle, muscle tissue at a little faster rate than they will later on. 
the rate of accretion or, or the rate of growth of muscle slows down over time. So you want to make sure you have good energy to get started with. Okay. Um, depending on what your final body weight is, you probably want to get somewhere around 150 to 170 grams um, on your on your bird in the first week. So we're talking somewhere about <clears throat> a little over a, a quarter to a half a pound, somewhere in that range, depending on the breed. Okay. Um, so make sure that you have good. If if we use um, wheat in the diet, if you're going to use wheat, you should use a little bit of corn also to help balance it out. The problem if you have too much wheat in the diet is that you may need to add a special enzyme because chickens cannot use all the gluten and some of the other things in wheat as efficiently and sometimes it ties them up. So if you have some proper enzymes that can be supplemented and added to the feed, then the wheat can be utilized very well. Um, and you want to be careful about saturated fats in the diet, and that's the animal type fats that are solid. You want to uh, make sure that total fat, somewhere around 5% uh, for broiler starter. You don't want high fat in the starter. You're going to add fat later in the finisher diet if you need to. So grower feeds, normally 14 to 16 days, and that's the transition because now they're starting to slow their growth down. They're transitioning from high levels of protein being utilized to make lots of muscle fast to slowing down a little bit of muscle growth and starting to put a little bit of fat on too. And of course, they're changing feathers, so they're growing feathers. They've gone through a set of feathers or two at this time, and they need to grow those out. And the finisher feed is probably one of the major costs because that's your last three to four weeks of feeding depending on, on how long you're going to feed them out and what type of bird you have. These birds will, <coughs> excuse me, the broiler feeds are there to finish up and put a little bit of fat on them for extra flavor. And the, the thing you want to be careful of is not to get them what we call too hot in the diet. In other words, get too high protein or too high fat so the bird accumulates too fast and goes down on its legs. You want it to be healthy and you want it to be moving at the end of the period. So you can either do um, a starter, grower, finisher combo, all three, or some people do just a broiler and a grower and you know, for the longer period of time, then they switch to a finisher maybe for a last week or so, just a little bit. So it depends on what your final outcome of your bird is that you want, how heavy and how fat. Now, I don't expect everyone to sit there and look at this chart and memorize and understand a lot about what's going on here, but this is basically showing you what a uh, starter, grower, and finisher diet as far as amino acid contents and digestibility should be. And this is what nutritionists look at. Um, and this is what the commercial breeder companies that are making these broilers for you, the ones that are producing the breeders, uh, they get charts and they test and they say, well, this is how our bird's going to grow well if this is what they're fed. So this is basically what they're looking at and saying that these are the the requirements that will make them meet the ideal growth for this type of breed. So you can look at this one. But this is what some diets really look like. This is some of the ingredients you can put in. Um, showed a couple of different options here to show if you're using corn, wheat, barley. Uh, again, soybean meal is used in pretty much all of them. Corn it would be used in all of them, again, because it balances out with the soybean meal, like we said. Some people use a meat meal, or if you're not using meat meal, other people are using fish meal now. Uh, fish meal is, is very good because it's high in omega-3 fatty acids, which again is good for us, it's good for the bird too. So you can substitute in uh, a, a fish meal, which would be somewhere around 45, and this percent behind soybean meal, percent behind meat meal here means that it's 48 percent protein or 50 percent protein. Um, and then there's fat, limestone and calcium phosphate. They're put in the diet to add your calcium and phosphorus. There's something important to get in here, and you need to know is that you need a good ratio of two to one calcium to phosphorus in your poultry diet. So if you're mixing at home, make sure you get that two to one ratio. The reason for that is calcium and phosphorus are used in bone uh, growth as well as muscle. You need calcium for proper muscle growth and transmission of uh, the neurotransmitters and, and 
everything in the muscle, and you need calcium. Obviously, if you have a layer bird, quite a bit of calcium. But for your, for your broiler birds, if you want good leg salmon, you need that good calcium phosphate ratio. So make sure that goes in. Now, one of the things about some of the bugs, like crickets and um, using um, roaches and some of the bugs that they'll get in the ground, they actually leach calcium in the diet and bind calcium in the gut. That's why you want to make sure they limit how many of the bugs they get and how they eat them and make sure that you have a good calcium uh, source in your diet so that you don't end up with this uh, problem. It's a, it's a leaching problem. And not only does it happen in, in poultry, but it happens in lizards and things like that. Uh, people have iguanas that uh, they're feeding lots of crickets and bugs to and they end up with calcium disorders or they end up with calcium and vitamin D rickets in their birds because, or when they're iguanas because they're being leached out. So if you look at the analysis here, it says calculate analysis down at the bottom here. Um, we've got crude protein. You start out with a starter here. Example is about 22%. It drops down to either 21 or 20% when you get in the grower and down to 18 to up to as low as 16 percent uh, in your finisher diets. Again, because by the time they're a finisher, they're not putting as much muscle on as much as they're putting on fat. And if you look at this energy here, this is uh, kilocalories, that's 1,000 calories per kilogram. And there's 2.2 pounds in a kilogram if you want to do a conversion to look at that. And you see, we want to make sure there's almost 1% calcium in that diet all the way through. And again, about a 0.42, so again, about a 2 to 1 ratio of calcium to phosphorus. Can milk, somebody want to know if milk can be used with chickens as a calcium source? Uh, milk is used as a calcium source. It's also used for some protein and some of the fats. but. Uh, Again, you want to be careful not to give them too much milk because some of them get a little diarrhea if they have way too much in the, in the diet. But people do use milk, small amounts. Uh, I would say about 2 to 3 percent of their total intake on a day is pretty good. <coughs> and you don't have to worry about it. Let's get into a little bit about pasture management because uh, a lot of you are going to be raising birds either on regular pasture or in range, however you want to call it, or outside in the yard. Alfalfa is a, is a really good source uh, of nutrients. It's, it's a high protein type of grass. However, in New England, we have pretty acid soil. So you're going to have to do a lot of liming if you want a really good alfalfa crop. Uh, as a replacement for alfalfa, the Ladino Crover has been found and really good. And it's also a high protein type of uh, grass that can be fed for poultry, and the poultry like it, it's highly digestible. So there's some combinations here. Um, and I'll show you some different mixes here in a second that you can use in pastures that work really good. They've been tested. And these are things I, I, I found that they're using 60, 70 years ago when most all the growers are out on pasture and they're working good trying to get them to grow. So any of the clovers are pretty good. The white or red clover and ladino work good. A little mix of orchard grass, Kentucky blue, rye grass and alfalfa works really good. What we found though is they only get somewhere up the maximum of about 15 or so percent of dry matter for their diet from pasture. Uh, a turkey may bring in a little bit more, maybe up to 25, 30 percent, but basically you can't just figure your bird's going to eat grass and survive or, or it's going to go out and eat grass and it's going to eat weeds and it's going to eat bugs and it's going to grow well. It just isn't going to do well when you do that. You really have to have a, a supplemental feed source and figure that about 15 percent of their intake will be from the grasses and the pasture and the rest has to come from your, your complete feed. Um, so this source you can go look at free range poultry com that talk about more more information on poultry management. This is some mixtures I found out of a, a 1947 book called uh, Profitable Poultry Management, and uh, it was one of the hot books of the day. It had gone through several revisions from about 1920 to 1947, and all of them kept increasing or improving on what type of uh, pasture mixtures. So. Cornell University came up with this pasture mixture that still works today, works pretty good. And this is on a per acre basis. They would mix 12 pounds of Kentucky bluegrass, 6 pounds of perennial rye, 
and two pounds of uh, Ladino clover. And then some of the other ones over at Penn State, they had a little bit more of a uh, diverse mixture in there, but pretty much all of them are adding a couple of pounds of Ladino clover to their mix, and it works pretty good. Uh, the other one here from University of Maryland, uh, again for the soils and type they have down there, looks like the bluegrass and Timothy work good, but again, the Ladino's in there because it increases the amount of protein. So these are all some good samples of what I would say good pasture mixes or seed mixes to use on your pasture to arrange birds. Uh, here's some other ones that are being used recently. Uh, I found some, some good seed mixtures here that are more from the 80s and 90s that so people have been trying. Uh, some of these are from different parts of the world. so. If you know what some of these plants are and you can find them, you want to try them, go for it too. Um, uh, one of the questions here is about can a producer provide limestone, calcium, phosphate, free choice to the broilers of that worry? Um, some people have tried that. I don't think that, that birds have what we call a nutritional sense. In other words, how much they're going to eat and when they're going to eat and how much they get. What people have done for a little bit of calcium is use oyster shell. They usually use that for the layer birds when they're having shell problems with their with their eggshells. I haven't seen too many people use this for broilers or try to free range on the broiler. The problem with the broilers once they get big and they get a little slower moving, they don't tend to want to go out and, and just hunt for the minerals that way. They do get some from the soil, but it isn't the same mix. So I, I prefer getting a good mineral mix into your feed if you can. So I wish there was an easy answer for that, but there really isn't. Um, so this this table four mixture was a representative of what they call the robust pasture mix. It works pretty good. Uh, other people lately have been saying if they add some herbs, some of the rosemary, sage, or oregano, thyme, uh, these all have antioxidant capabilities and some some people feel that they have antimicrobial activities. So if you're going organic, many of the organic poultry growers are using some of these herbs to offset um, what they can't use in medications, and it seems to work pretty good. Um, if you can, uh, it, they say these herbs will reduce the incidence of use of the synthetic antioxidants, so it works pretty good. And this came from a symposium on nutrition of farm animals outdoors and stuff by Walker and them, so I put that information here. You can look that up and get a little more details. Um, so moving along here, let's talk about housing equipment, some suggestions on, on what can be done out there. What you use depends, again, on the type of room management that you want. Conventional would be totally enclosed, mechanical a mechanically ventilated facility, that would be a commercial broiler house. And some of these are anywhere from you know 20,000 birds up to about 40, 60,000 birds, depending on size facility. They don't usually get them much bigger than that because then it's hard for a worker to go through and, and check birds and maintain health and quality on those birds. Excuse me, a lot of people now like the pasture pens, as they call them, or chicken tractors. Excuse me, I need a little water there. And they work pretty good. Again, you, you, something you're going to have to move, and I'll show you some pictures of those. And then they have what we call free range pasture, where you have a, a permanent fixed type uh, of building out there as uh, protection for the birds and basic shelter. And then you're pretty much raising birds only in the summertime because you're really not bringing them inside at all during the winter. So this is basically what the, some of the older chicken tractors, some of the first ones, came out looking like as basically a kind of a, a TP or a, or a, a pyramid shape with some wheels or something in the back so you could drag them along. This guy was using some metal sheds here. He also had a hanging bucket with water that fed a tube down to a bell-type drinker that worked pretty good. Um, I have a question I'm going to look at. It says, tell us what you mean by powerful antioxidant capabilities. They pass this quality in their meat, or is this personal? It's for the, for the, uh, the antioxidant works for the chicken itself. 
it doesn't put that much into the meat. No, it's it's basically that the antioxidants are there so that the fats that they're eating and they're, and they're metabolizing uh, are good. And you need antioxidants in your system to get rid of what they call the free radicals. In other words, you got oxygen molecules floating around when they shouldn't be that destroy some of the nutrients. So by taking antioxidants into your system, you are maintaining your uh, low levels of these free radicals. I'm sure some of you have heard of that before, talking about free radicals and having to be cleansed and all that. Well, basically what it is when you take antioxidants, there's enough of natural antioxidants that you have in your system from eating regular foods, and they, they help keep those free radicals from getting all over the place. Um, the other question, is it really worth raising broilers through the winter months in New England uh, inside? Uh, if, you, if you're willing to put heat in and you have a well-insulated house and you can get a market for your birds, if you're selling broilers at $6 a pound, then I think you could probably raise them year-round and, and do just fine uh, if you have people that want to buy them. Um, Got to remember that the, a lot of the broiler industry actually started up here in this region <coughs> with the high energy feeds that were developed in the University of Connecticut. We had a lot of broiler processors up in Maine and throughout New England at one time, and they were growing them year round until they found it cheaper for labor and for energy down south. So that's probably what really moved it. Some more types of what we call chicken housing, pasture housing that's easily movable. Uh, pretty much up to your imagination. The main thing there is to keep your birds protected from wild birds and predators by the fenced in, and also so they don't just wander all over the place and get lost, because sometimes birds tend to do that. So these are some of the movable units. Uh, depending on where you are, if you have pastures that, that you want to move your birds in and you want to get your birds close to your house at the end of the growing period, the best thing to do is start at the far end of your pasture and start moving forward so that at the end of your growing period when your birds are at market weight, they're going to be closer to where you're going to be processing rather than having to walk all the way at the end of your pasture. So moving things around. This is kind of a setup that some person uh, came up with, which is a good idea, kind of a linear setup here. So he's got uh, some feeders, he's got his little uh, skid house that he can move around, he's got waters, and so the birds are all very close to everything and they have some, some fenced in range. Uh, as far as fencing around your range, a lot of people are using that electrified mesh that goes around, works really good, electric mesh fencing. That helps keep away some of the predators, not the aerial predators, but the ground predators. Uh, that works really good, uh, it's worth the investment. Bottom line again, if, if you can do this for, for drafty periods, you want to keep them in a dry and draft free environment during the, during the cold months. Uh, in the summer, you want fresh air and lots of fresh air, and you want air movement when it's very hot. So if it's really, really hot out and your birds are panting, get a fan, put it on them. If they're still panting, go out and spray them with water and cool them down because they don't sweat. All they can do is breathe and try to cool off that way. So some feeding water and equipment. I prefer the nipple waterers. The reason why, it's natural for the bird. Chickens do not have the ability to create a vacuum in their mouth. They have what's called a cleft palate, so there's a slit in the upper roof of their mouth. So look inside the bird's mouth, and you'll see that there's that kind of a slit there, and it goes right to their nasal passage. So if they try to suck, they can't, unless you close off their nose, which they don't have fingers to close their nose off. So therefore, birds put, put their beak into the water, they scoop it up in their beak, put their head up, and allow gravity to push water back down. So rather than having to go through that motion, the nipple water keeps their head up so the water can dribble down into their uh, esophagus the way it should, and uh, it works really well. And you can train birds to nipple real easy, uh, and you can make nipple waters that can be used out in pasture anywhere you want, and I'll show you some in a minute. Feeders. Uh, are very important. Okay, uh, if you look at the the last slide again, we have a feeder here. This is a commercial house. Obviously, you got the feeder over here in the left side, the the picture, and the water on the right side. And you notice the the feeder here is red. Uh, they use and also the water has a red color to it. The birds see red very well, and they're also attracted to things that are are different from what they in their surroundings. So. They like things like that, and they're good attractors, and you're trying to get your bird to eat, so you want them attracted. These are other types of feeders. 
I don't recommend the long trough feeders because it's hard to raise them up when you need them and then they stand in them. The best thing are hanging type feeders, the circular feeders here, that you can hang and uh, put feed in and gravity feed and you can put covers on them like the ones for outside which work really good for range feeders. And then you can raise them up because the lip of the feeder should always be uh, level with the flat of their back as much as you can. One, it's easy for the, that way the bird puts its head over and it's not throwing feed all over the place and if it does back into the feeder it's not making deposits where it shouldn't. So that's why I like the hanging feeders. Okay. Uh, this is a homemade feeder somebody made out of a barrel. He made some cutouts in here and put some little uh, head areas so the bird put their head in. So you push, push the cutout back into the, into the barrel there and then what happens is the feed doesn't just roll out. It's kind of like the, uh, the gerbil feeders and things they have for, uh, for cages and stuff works pretty good. So this, this is a big barrel. Um, I think he puts holes in. You can hang it if you want. I, I haven't seen this personally. It's the picture one I thought was interesting. If you want to go through that much trouble, I think it's easier to buy them. Waters, a lot of people like the bell type waters or the gravity feed. Uh, waters like this. Again, the problem with that is they're open. Dirt and manure can get into them and uh, you have to keep them clean. The nipple systems work a little better. Uh, here's a homemade feeder and water system this guy made. He took uh, a couple of big water jugs that used for water coolers and cut them and then put a little feeder device on, on that one for the feeder and then for the watering device he put some holes in it. Again, seems like a lot of trouble and the bird still has to put its head down, but here's what I prefer, the, the nipple waters. You can put a nipple, you can put up to four or five nipples on the bottom of a five gallon bucket and if you want you can actually get a small float valve and put it in the bucket and you can put a lid on it, keep it clean, just put a little air hole up on the side of the bucket somewhere so you don't go to vacuum created and put the nipples in and then you can raise the bucket as you need to as the birds get bigger. The advantage of this is you always have clean water uh, you just clean the bucket out once every couple of weeks to make sure no scum is growing if you have uh, the water sitting in. And the birds are, are getting it naturally and you're not giving a water source for rodents and other vermin because the waters that are on the ground are very easy for rodents to get into and get. They don't get the nipples very well. So that's feeders and waters and some of the basic equipment. One of the questions was up is when do I process my birds? Well, you process them when they hit the live weight that you're looking for to get the carcass weight that you're looking for. Remember I said it's about 75%. So if you use that as your, as your average uh, on a good broiler, it'll be about 75% of live weight. On some of these slower growing, uh, more bony broilers, you're going to get more of a 70 to 72% dressing percentage. So when you think you've got the weight on them, that's when you want to process. And processing, it, it involves stunning the bird, okay, and then exsanguinating, which means to bleed out the bird, and then scalding for defeathering, and I like to scald somewhere between 138 and 145 degrees Fahrenheit water, and that'll take somewhere between 60 and 90 seconds to get a good scald. You don't want to over scald because that actually loosens or tears the skin. You end up scalding or burning the skin and then when you defeather you're pulling parts of the skin off and that doesn't look too good. And then of course you're defeathering, you're going to remove head, neck and legs below the hock and then you eviscerate and uh, a lot of people if they've seen the Joe Salatin or read their books and stuff like that, he does a lot of the, the open air and backyard uh, processing. If you keep things clean, that's what you really want to do uh, and sanitary. Uh, you can do a very good job. The best thing there is use lots of water. Fresh water flowing on your birds. Uh, dilution is the solution to keep salmonella and other organisms off your off your bird and keep them clean. So you eviscerate. You can save your viscera, put it in your uh, compost pile, and then you can use that for your uh, fertilizer for your property again. And then chill and package. So that's the processing steps. How to process depends. Uh, right now there's a movement for lots of mobile poultry processing units throughout New England. I know Vermont has one that's actually inside a truck and works pretty good. Uh, this is one of the units that's floating around I think uh, 
Massachusetts has one similar to this. It's, it's on the back of a, a truck. You just roll it out and you use it there, or you take it on the ground, put it under a tent. Um, so there's lots of different styles of this because not everyone can afford to buy the feather pickers and the scalders and all the other equipment that goes along with this to do a good job. So forming uh, a co-op and building one is a good idea. So this would be the clean side. They use an evisceration table here. Uh, way in the background here is the feather picker. The birds come out of the dirty side to the clean side, and then they get packaged. Last thing I want to finish up on that will answer questions is biosecurity. Why is that important and what can you do? Basically, if your birds are outside, you have no biosecurity because everything in the, that's outside is that walks by, that flies by, is possible source of disease for your bird. However, with low density, meaning you're not growing several thousand birds in, in a fairly tight or confined area, uh, it may not be as risky if the sun is out and you have a good growing season, you can do well. If you have rainy, a wet season, then you have lots of parasites out in your pasture. Worms carry all kinds of disease. Uh, people think earthworms are good, but earthworms carry worms. They carry other diseases. So you do want to be careful uh, on, on how much of that. And what kind of foot traffic you bring in from other farms, people that have other birds. If you show birds and you bring them back to your property, that's a source of potential contamination. So using common sense, that's biosecurity just to keep your birds healthy. So finishing up, I've put some sources of information on raising poultry. Again, this is not an end-all for all of them, and uh, doesn't mean I endorse all these or anything, all the materials in them. Again, it's like everything else out there, get to sources that are somewhat trusted and knowing what, what the source is. Uh, if you're going to buy feed, if you're going to buy birds, anything like that, get it from a trusted source because you kind of get what you pay for. Well, that's the end of the slide set, so let me look and see if some of these questions are uh, that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, JBZ says, with Buff Orpington, slower growing roosters, is it possible to wait too long? In other words, when they reach a maturity, the taste of the meat is ruined. Is that true? Uh, not necessarily. What happens with a intact male is that you might get a little tougher meat and they start getting feisty. Um, that's why they did capons for many, many years, because it took so long to grow a broiler to a large large body weight uh, or heavy body weight, and then they became a little tougher because of the testosterone from the testes, so they caponized them, and they'd be a lot more tender. They're somewhere you know, between a, a, a male and a female at that point, and they become very fatty and tender. Right now, with commercial broilers, they don't need to caponize much because you can grow a broiler to about 12 or 13 pounds before it hits sexual maturity. Uh, so that's one of the issues with raising a dual purpose or slower growing male type birds. So a lot of people would try to get females in these other breeds because you don't have the issue. You do get a little more fat, but then you also get the flavor from it. Um, and then there's a question, is there a rule of thumb for pounds of feed per pound of final body weight for a typical male broiler? Again, for commercial, for the Cornish cross, you're going to end up somewhere under, you know, two pounds or so of feed or under, somewhere between 1.7 to two pounds of feed per pound of body weight gain, live weight gain, if you're going to uh, a body weight of about five pounds. When you start going over five pound live weight, then that ratio starts to change and you get over two, you get up in the two to three range because now you're you're using that energy in the feed to make fat, and uh, it's not as efficient. So that's one of the things we have there. Uh, females, um, females tend to grow a little slower than the males. On average, uh, could be two to three days to market weight difference, which is why running what they call a straight run flock of males and females, they have some some differences in body weight when they go to processors. So some of them like straight straight run, some of them like all male or all female flocks. Um, is there a red Cornish as a meat bird? Uh, I'm sure there's red Cornish. There's The Cornish bird itself is a slower growing heavy bird. And they cross that with a white rock to get the white broiler bird that we have today. Uh, the white rock put on a little bit, a little faster. Um, 
body, it gives a little more body size, it changes the growth rate a little bit, uh, it also got a little bit of egg production in them because one of the problems with the true meat type strains is that they're, the females were very low in reproductive rate so you didn't get a lot of uh, offspring. So it got a little expensive to get the meat birds out there. But uh, the question is, should you withhold feed from birds 24 hours prior to slaughter? No. Uh, four hours or so is, is pretty good. They can pass a meal anywhere between six and seven hours. Again, depending on, on what they're eating uh, and how digestible it is and what else they have. Uh, the idea is to keep the gut as clean as possible, especially the cropping and the lower intestine because if you break those you don't want a lot of feed stuff floating around when you're processing your bird. We usually here at UConn when we raise our broilers we take them off feed for four to six hours and they're pretty much cleaned out. They look pretty good. So that's a good question there. Any other questions? Put them out there. I know this is, is kind of a whirlwind. There's a lot of information here. But again there's a lot of good good books out there to read and other, other information and you can contact me through email and we'll try to answer questions the best we can. Um, so the next one, what size is just for the largest possible flock or batch while still being safe? Um, it depends on how much space you have and how, how big you want to go. Um, when you say large flock, we have commercial flocks of 30,000 birds. I don't think anyone's going to raise 30,000 birds on pasture out here in any one flock at a time because that's a lot to look out for and watch. Um, so I guess for, for Ben, how many birds do you want to do uh, and how much space do you have? Because like I say, if you're running about 100 birds per acre, okay, which is really maximizing that, that's a lot of birds on that acre. Uh, you're going to have to do some, some pasture management. One of the things about pasture, by the way, I failed to mention is you need to mow the pasture. It shouldn't be more than six inches tall. If it gets real high, what happens is the, the birds drop manure on it, it bends over and they walk on it and they start pushing down the uh, stalks and the, and the leaves and stuff and they start making kind of a mat of it and then they drop manure on top of it so the manure isn't going into the soil, it's sitting on top of the pasture grasses that you have. So you want to keep them mowed and the second reason for keeping them mowed is now you have fresh uh, grass coming up all the time and the fresh grass is the highest protein and better quality and more moisture. So that's the best thing to do. Um, and the moderator asks, are meat birds inefficient eaters? I.e., well, they eat more than their bodies can turn into meat if allowed free choice. Only at, at the end of their cycle, as they start getting over 8 to 10 pounds, they start converting more into fat and less than to, into muscle. And they're, they're very, very efficient early on, but they're very inefficient later on. It's just like humans. The older we get, I guess you can say we get very efficient because we put fat on real easy. So, but is that the efficiency you're looking for? Uh, that's pretty much how birds do it, the same way. Uh, if allowed free choice, uh, you want to do free choice on broilers as they're growing because they need the energy and they need the feed to grow. Um, one of the top health problems for broilers being raised six to eight weeks of age, uh, one, leg problems if they're not if they're not managed properly, they can end up with hock or leg problems and go down on that because they don't tend to want to walk. Uh, in pasture reared birds, when they start getting six to eight weeks, then you have worm problems because by then the worms are, are really getting mature inside them and growing a lot. So worming can be an issue. The other thing is uh, parasites, other parasites, lice and mites that can be out in pasture. Uh, generally, if you have good sunlight, and, and the birds are in fresh air, you don't have as many of the respiratory problems, bronchitis, laryngo, coryza, some of the other respiratory diseases aren't as prevalent in a pasture bird if they have good fresh air. Um, so uh, again, we can, it's a whole seminar on health. I didn't really want to go in details on that uh, too much right now because that takes some time. What's the best way to minimize ascites? Slow the birds down. Don't grow birds up in high altitudes. Um, birds will get ascites. For those that don't know what ascites is, it means water belly. But what happens is they they grow faster 
then their organs can sustain it, especially the heart and lungs. And the heart starts pumping really hard to get blood to all the tissues that are requiring oxygen. Because the muscles are growing so fast, they require lots of oxygen. The heart can only pump so much blood, and the lungs can only put out so much oxygen. But the tissues keep saying, give me more. So now the heart tries to work a little harder, which means now the right heart that pumps blood to the lungs starts pumping harder. And as the muscle pumps more or uses more, it tends to grow. When that right heart starts to grow, it separates the valves. So now you get leakage, and you don't get valve closure, and you get right heart insufficiency, and the bird dies. But in the process of all this pressure going on, you actually get leaking of serum, which is the liquid part of the blood. The serum leaks through the liver, and some of it actually leaks into the lungs. So they die from, from suffocation in the lungs, and they die from pressure of the pericardial sac around the heart. And when you open them up, in their abdominal cavity, they're going to have lots of this yellowish looking fluid. And that's a typical sign of ascites. So what you want to do is slow the growth of your broilers down. If they're getting too fat and you have any dye, then you got too hot a mixture, too much protein, too much energy, um, and they're, they're eating too fast. So then you can do feed restriction. In other words, reduce the amount of feed to do that. Um, <clears throat> OK, what do we recommend to worm an organically raised birds? Uh, for deworming is what you want to do. I don't like to give them worms. Ha, ha, ha. Anyway, you want to deworm them. And organically, there's not much they can do. A lot of people try to use diatomaceous earth. Or they use a combination of a 5% vinegar using the white cider vinegar uh, in their water, and then adding uh, the diatomaceous, the feed grade diatomaceous earth to help get rid of the worms. I'm not sure what else is working these days. There may be some citrus byproducts that are working. Uh, I don't know that much about it. Um, put email down, chat box. Let's see. Again, can diatomaceous earth be fed to chickens to help with parasite control? Some people feel that it does reduce the worms a little bit. Others aren't, aren't quite sure about it. They use DE also on their bodies in their dust bath. So if you're going to have them dust bathe outside to get rid of external parasites, DE works real good, along with the sand. I like a 50% mixture of sand. And that DE makes a really good dust bath for the birds. So that works pretty good. Um, how does raising broilers compare to raising ducks, geese, turkeys, or game birds for meat? They all have their own special problems. Again, the broilers. Broilers and game birds are about some of the fastest. Ducks go pretty quick, too. You can get a good duckling in you know, uh, six to 10 weeks. So uh, they're all very similar. They have their different problems. Um, I think they're all good. Again, if you have the market and you can get the feed for them, the main thing is making sure you get the proper feed. And uh, if you're using uh, a medicated starter feed, some use a medicated starter feed to control coccidiosis, because that, that can be a problem. Others don't because the birds only going to be raised about six to eight weeks, and they don't consider it a problem. So there's lots of different issues there. Uh, does DE tie up nutrient? I'll answer those last questions. Not that I know of. Uh, I haven't heard anyone saying that it, it does a problem there, but it's good to know. Well, well, everybody, thank you for listening. And uh, I'm sure we'll be doing some more webinars in the future on different subjects. Let Jesse know what you'd like to learn more about. And we can revisit these. Thank you very much, yeah, everybody. Yeah, Mike, thank you very much. Um, that was excellent. And did you want to share the uh, poultry page, um, the poultry resources page that's on the University of Maine, where they can sign up for uh, the list of upcoming events for poultry producers? Did you have that email or that website? Oh, on my thing here, I don't. Oh, and I think I forgot to put it down to, on the list of references here. Um, no, but you know who can do that? Uh, get uh, Rich Brzezowski if you're on there. Why don't you put down your web address and you're in the. There we go. Here it so is. So 
Thanks, Rich. That's what right. we're looking there is for. A, if you go on that on the uh, right-hand side of that web page, there is a list you can sign up for to get emails about upcoming webinars and things like that specifically related to poultry and this extension poultry project that's been going on. Um, so I just wanted people to be aware of that too. And have a good evening and happy holidays. And Mike, thanks again for joining us um, to share all of your knowledge about raising poultry. It's great. Thank you, Jesse, and wish we had more time, but All next right. time. Have a good Christmas, everybody. Good bye night. bye. And I'm seeing emails uh, onto the chat box here. Go ahead, and uh, I'll leave this open a few more minutes. You can put your emails in. We'll send you some follow up information. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. <laughs>